Hi, welcome to Bookmark. I'm your host, Don Noble. Today's guest is author Lee Roselle, professor of literature at the University of Montevallo, and most recently, the author of an unusual novel, Ballad of Jasmine Wills. I spoke with Lee Roselle in Studio A in the Digital Media Center on the campus of the University of Alabama. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thank we were, you so much for yeah, letting me be here. We were supposed to meet this week at the cooperative annual meeting, and I despair. I think uh, the literary conferences in Alabama, oh, they just aren't thriving the way they did. They used to be Jacksonville and, and uh, Birmingham Southern. And, and the MLF. You know, I, I, I don't limit this yes, to Montevallo, just yes. yeah, literary fest. I think we all after COVID have to get used to doing things again. Right. Getting in a car, going into traffic, um, looking at people, standing in line. <laughs> it's not something that we're used to anymore. And yes. so it's uh, hopefully we hopefully have, next year it'll be flourishing. And we're going to have to breathe air that might possibly have been breathed by somebody else in the, <laughs> in the recent past. <laughs> I know that now you're a professor of English at Montevallo, and but I, that, that's about all I know. Where where were you born, raised, educated? What's your story before Montevallo? I was uh, born in Mobile um, and spent from two to about seventeen in uh, Clay County, Alabama, oh. and the nearest Coke machine was twelve miles away. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we were just out in a, you know, single wide trailer in 1973, four, five, six, and seven at the edge of uh, the Talladega National Forest on, and Hatchet Creek. And uh, when they drove away with my trailer and we were trying to build a house, uh, I just saw it saw the trailer drive away and I said that's the only room I've ever had and it, and it just just took off to up the road so um, I'm a I'm from Alabama and I traveled extensively to to for grad school I went to Mississippi to mm -hmm. Southern Miss and mm -hmm. um, and so yeah I've been bumping around uh, colleges since then so. you didn't go from um, Hattiesburg to Montevallo I went from uh, South Alabama for my bachelor's uh -huh. to Southern Miss, and then then to LSU for a couple of years oh, as good. an instructor, oh. and um, and sort of scurrying out of the way of these you know Norse gods walking by with all their publications and and teaching a lot of comp and uh, and did that for two years while I was finishing up my dissertation, and then then luckily. Um, after the market and everything is all over, Mo University of Montevallo opened up a job that obviously they had a troubled search and they wanted somebody to teach grammar. And I <laughs> all right. taught a class, an upper 300 level class in grammar. And so I dusted myself off. I was a, a charming grammarian. I went in and was able to land a job. I taught that grammar class one time. The education department, they didn't like it, and so I got to start doing my own work, my <laughs> eco-criticism and Teach, stuff like that. Teaching so, English. So I literature. just lucky. Yeah. Like in February, I got to get that, well, get that interview. I, I, I think my, over many years of having friends at Montevallo and visiting often, I've, I've always had a very high opinion of the place. I think... I think it is a uh, less well known as a happy, warm, mm -hmm. liberal arts college. Right. It, it deserves a better, a even better reputation than I think it has. Yeah, I mean, when I go into my uh, sophomore classes and junior classes, and, and definitely up the upper level classes, uh, the students are ready. Oh, I mean, how and nice! They are. I mean, I. 
I, I just love this, yeah. this part of the job. Well, in graduate school, and then in your early publications, you became an eco-critic. And I have read a great deal of your first two books, Zombie Scapes and Phantom Zones and Eco Sublime. And I'm not an eco-critic, <laughs> but, but, but I'm curious. Mm -hmm. A lot of our, there's, there's a term that you use a lot and it's important and it's liminal. Mm -hmm. And liminal is what? The space between here and there? Right. The borderlands, what? Right, it's not only the space between here and there, it is also a, a time like adolescence. It is a time where things are up in the air. Mm -hmm. It is a time when things are, are changing rapidly. Uh, a time when sort of identity boundary is all in flux. And liminality is nothing if it stays in that flux. It has to move towards communitas is the, is the term. Uh, and this idea when it relates to the natural environment is, yes. is that we, are, we have these spaces like dead parking lots, uh, like old clear cuts, like uh, you know, junkyards, like rooftops that we look at and say, that place is over. On an ecological level, that, that place is, is done. Dead? Right, this is dead, but it's not dead, right? It is in process. We can't change what we've already done. We can't change, uh, go back in time and, and stop those mistakes. Right. So I'm looking at those monstrous places and saying, what ecological value do these spaces have? What ecological value do they have? Right, I mean, um, I was writing this at a time when I think I was far more idealistic and hopeful. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, I looked at things like rooftop gardens and, uh, you know, public, uh, use, of, use of public areas and, and that sort of thing right. as a means to show, a, you know, a, an opportunity to look at these spaces anew. Yeah. One thing I did take from, from reading is that we're not going back. <laughs> we're not fixing it, make it the way it was before. So we, we, you either, you're re, we're either faced with a kind of nihilism and hopelessness mm -hmm. or we make it into something right. different. Right, exactly. You know, I think if you watch movies and, and the news, everybody, we're, this ecological crisis lends itself to an apocalyptic resolution. Exactly. And I want to deny that, right? I want right. to uh, demonstrate how uh, this sort of huge cataclysmic event is gonna occur in ways that are far more subtle, that may be far less convenient and yeah. far less romantic than, you know, a huge iceberg or, a, you know, that's kind of thing that you see in the movies. But there is, <clears throat> I, 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 I sound as if I know what I'm talking about and I don't, but there does seem to be a, a thread of Armageddon, mm -hmm. a thread of apocalypse that runs through your, your theory and also the pieces of literature that you've chosen mm -hmm. to, uh, to write about. Yeah, definitely. I think, um, I think given the sort of prevailing attitude that we see in works like Oryx and Craig by Margaret Atwood right, right. and, and uh, other sort of futuristic works is that in order to grapple with this uh, environmental conundrum that I, at that point, I had to, I had to look into apocalyptic kind of ideas in, in order to figure out where I was. Mm -hmm. And the attitude that I had when I wrote that book um, is, I've changed quite a bit since then. <laughs> One of the documents, and I, I found it interesting that you write about, uh, there, your, your chapters are about short stories, about novels, about poems, and about the Unabomber 
Proclam uh, the Unabomber Manifesto. Manifesto, that's the word. And it was it was called something much longer when he yeah. made the Washington Post and New York Times but publish you, that. You've explained why Ted Kaczynski found it necessary to write a manifesto that would explain why he was sending bombs to blow up people. <laughs> well, I don't know if I was exactly justifying that. No, no, behavior. I don't think you were justifying him. <laughs> But you were explaining why he thought he needed to do it. Right. I mean, this, you know, when you, when you pull back from, obviously, this person's psychopathology yeah, and yeah. crime, the pain that Theodore Kaczynski felt out there in that little shack yeah, yeah. is the pain that many of us feel when looking at the future and our relationship to the planet. <laughs> Well, the evening news is more than justifying any pessimism <laughs> that, that, that you exhibited in these books. I mean, this part of the world's on fire, this part's underwater. The, the, ice, the ice is melting here and the, and the, the countries are going underwater here. Yeah, I no. mean, the, the ideas that are, are in both of those books have just been, um, I mean, it's... It's all manifested, yeah. it's all there, and it's in living color in a way that it seemed like an idea in 2006, or even in 2016. These are concepts that are happening in the future, and now, um, there it is. Every day. All right, what is, I read as carefully as I knew how, Burke, Kant, the sublime. Yes. And now, Eco sublime, mm -hmm. and this is a way. Let me see if if I can begin. Eco sublime is a, a state in which one is moved to a transcendence in accord with the nature around you. Uh, the romantic <laughs> concept of the sublime and what you're talking about with uh, Burke and Kant is like okay. I go to Mount Blanc, yes. I look at Mount Blanc, and I have a moment that is simultaneously yes. terrifying and awe-inspiring, right. and I'm elevated from that, okay? And so the idea of the eco-sublime is, first of all, there is no Mount Blanc, okay? We live in a postmodern world, right? And it is only through the terror and awe of catastrophe that we can, ecological catastrophe, that we can apprehend the referent in the way that the Romantic uh, poet saw just a mountain, right? I mean, we have to go through like Baudrillard or like the hyperreal, uh, and the only thing that can do that is something that is a shock to the senses. In our contemporary moment, a catastrophe. Right, rather, and I'm rather writing this in 2006, of, where yeah. there were there were it was like uh, you can you can see it's pretty. <laughs> I had the hole in the ozone layer down there, so uh, I well, would have had a lot more material uh, if I'd written that book now. Well, for reasons known only to you, <laughs> you, you made a okay. real shift and decided you were going to produce a very funny, very readable novel. <laughs> it is. My, my understanding of the novel is it is a satire, in a sense, of reality t TV, but it's a lot of other things, too. Let's talk about reality TV itself for a second. Okay. Actually, at the, around the time that I was reading um, the Jasmine Wills, I, I look, I look on the uh, pr program, you know, I have a little control for what's going to be on tonight, Yes, a huge percentage mm -hmm. of network television, broadcast television, is some kind of reality TV. It's, it's way more than half. <laughs> I know it's cheaper, and I know you don't have to hire writers or actors, ex right. exactly. But it's taking, why is, is something that I, in my snootiness, find absolutely reprehensible and, <laughs> and stupid. <laughs> why is it taking over the world? Okay. I, uh, I, I will confess right now that I do not even have a television or any commercial uh, 
<laughs> you know, uh, I we stream, you know, yeah. uh, Amazon Prime and Netflix according to what we want, and, yeah. and are outraged when the commercials come on. And so my experience has been like being in a hotel, and then all of a sudden a commercial comes on or a show comes on, and hearing people talk about it and think, "Wow, there there's something really interesting." going on here and I saw this commercial I was you know stretched out on a some sort of uh, bed in a hotel and I was just almost asleep and I was watching this and I saw um, Fear Factor a uh, show that I've never oh, watched sure, sure. Yeah, that's and there one. were people and I could tell by looking at their eyes that these were decent human beings but for some reason they were putting these poisonous worms into their mouths yeah, and they yeah. were stuffing that worm and you know all of these worms and they, the worms were like wriggling around and they had it in their mouth and I'm a little queasy and I and I thought could I mean at first I was just fascinated I was like what in the world would those people uh, do to get this attention what I mean how far would we go to what would we and then I thought what would I swallow to get some media attention? What would I? And 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 you know, uh, it it made me realize that that uh, that unscripted TV uh, is potentially ripe for satire. Oh, the producer of that that show. I mean, you cut like I'm going to make money by making people insert worms into their body or jump off something that's scary oh, yeah. or, you know, wipe out where you, you know, the total wipe out where they jump across the balls. Yes. They get two, one or two athletes to come and like Jay, they jump across really nicely and you're like, uh-huh. And then they get, say, now I have watched some of this. And, and then they get some poor person like me out of shape or something. And then they run to the ball and hit it and fall over in the water. And I'm just laughing with, I'm like, <laughs> I love it. I mean, why is that so right. exciting? That's this. That's very depressing. <laughs> but, but what? I, and it's a kind of, it's a kind of physical humiliation, and and it's based on greed. Okay, Big Brother, and the is closer to where your novel goes. That is mm -hmm. to say, people being filmed all the time, mm -hmm. and they've given up their privacy they've given up themselves and it occurs to me um, not that there's anything wrong with being on television mind you <laughs> but the the in, in your in your novel the, the the plot runs through two stages stage one reminded me of the Truman show hmm. in which the you remember the movie the Truman show yes that fellow is his whole life is a show. It's all on television, only right. he doesn't know it. Yes. And it occurs to me that, that one of the things you're pushing at is that, that we're all being videoed all the time, everywhere. In China, apparently, it's approaching totality. Right. And, you know, I, I let some of my uh, students who are, I guess, millennials or Gen Z read that, and and it, it, it was a, something was missing. It was like where I I have a lot of 20th century paranoia about privacy, right, and about the the cameras. I mean, I I am skeptical about becoming an automaton and and all of that sort of 20th century science fiction paranoia well right yeah and and so the idea of just being you know filmed all the time is completely horrifying and absurd to me what if i say something wrong uh that's this, this it doesn't fly with with that with that generation it's like what they I mean, don't mind no their conception of human privacy individual privacy apparently has altered from yours and another generation mine well that's the way your novel begins is is it is it uh, jasmine who's a loan officer in a bank has become the subject of of interest mm -hmm. she's being filmed tape i would say taped she's being recorded right all the time everywhere but she doesn't know it but then you have her kidnapped <laughs> yes <laughs> all right 
in a in a world that and one of the things that's that startled me immediately when you were describing her is that she is obese she eats all the time she is unpleasant unhappy friendless awful <laughs> yes <laughs> But you fell in love with her before it was over, right? No, 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 I, I didn't. I, 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 don't, I don't rule it out that someone might, but, <laughs> did but you, I thought did you, you were taking... Did you say she's a legitimate uh, perspective when it was all over? Did you, did you kind of... I thought you were taking a great risk at making fun of a fat person, period. Hmm. You know, I mean, in this kind of post-crypt theory... Um, sort of milieu that I'm dealing with. It's not the fatness, it's the attitudes towards fatness or disability that's the problem, mm -hmm. you know? And the, the main reason that I uh, wanted to focus on someone like Jasmine is that you or I might be kind of perturbed with her and think nothing of her and see her as a two-dimensional, Weight or a you know some you know and she has she has a disability synesthesia and things like that we we would not give her a minute we would look at her and say this is a deplorable person and she is deplorable well, she's not very nice no she's not nice right. she's not nice um, but by the time this is over everybody loves her right everybody loves her on on television on television all right we should say she's kidnapped and she's put into an egg shaped cell yes and she becomes aware fairly soon that she's on television 20 every second of her life right even the toilet is perhaps private but not right and she is reshaped in there they've got her exercising so she'll she'll be thinner <laughs> They've got a French chef bringing her delicious but low-calorie meals. Yes. They transform her on television. She, you know... It's being broadcast. Right. But she doesn't know that until later. Not until, like, the season's about over and they need to sign the contracts and get, you know, uh, the gag orders and the right. all of those. The lawyers have to be involved, and then they kind of alert her to this this fact you know this it just takes the dehumanization of the whole process jasmine is a person who we would otherwise not think is a star but can in this world be a star she, she, a cat I, can be she has followers a, she has yeah exactly viewers. you know a cat that knows how to jump in a circle can can have you know 70 million likes and you know i got i mean I, 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 these things are all true, lamentably, sadly true. I, I got a big kick out of the merchandise. <laughs> she's, she, does, she can't escape. She's, how long is she in that egg? She's, Six months yeah, or something? something like that. And, and the, 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 the scale, is, it never gives her a correct weight. I mean, I didn't quite explain that, but it was arbitrary. Like, she presumably loses weight, but the... The guys who are kind of setting up the show are like, well, what weight do we want her to be now so we, that we can have an arc? So there's no relationship between her actual weight and what the, that was saying. Right. Her weight was all arbitrary. She becomes a heroine. She becomes a, f a figure. People buy Jasmine t-shirts, mugs, all that stuff. Right. Everybody's making a fortune. Yes. She's utterly talentless but she has fans as if she were an opera singer or a ballet dancer. Right. And her, her... Well, What's wrong with American society that this thing is true, what I just said? Well, she displays um, rage, acrimony against fine food, against self-improvement. Against kind of Jane Fonda workout tapes. A against, <laughs> quote unquote, self-improvement. Yeah. And so at, at, at the same time, you know, Pygmalion or something, it's like, she doesn't, she doesn't want to be you. She doesn't want to be fit. She does not want to, to have that kind of body. When she looks at her body at the end of the book and is like, knows that men will want to treat her like the, some of the other uh, women who work at the bank, she's disgusted. She said, this is not me. This is not my body. So she has body dysmorphia the whole time. Even after her body is conventionally oh, yes. perfect. Right. 
definitely. She's going to go back to the old body? Um, <laughs> I mean, I hope not, generally speaking. I, Aesthetically speaking, anyway. Right. I, I think she might have picked up a few, <laughs> uh, you know, tips about eating vegetables. I think she's healthier, but I don't think she's clinging to this, this idea that there's something inherently wrong with her anymore. Are, are we all in it? I mean, there's, there's something I'm, I, I'm not saying this as clearly as I'd like, but is this a, is this a, a, a situation in which I, as reader, am um, guilty and caught up in the same kind of voyeuristic way mm -hmm. as the vo the people who are watching her on their television sets. Right. I mean, I think that um, I think we're all we are we we all hate our bodies. We all are underweight, overweight. Our pigment isn't quite right. Our follicles aren't quite right. Um, those of us who... Follicles, <laughs> is it? <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, if, uh, some of us have really uh, triangular feet and are sensitive about that. But, you know, I mean, I think we can all identify with feeling somehow this body dysmorphia where there's, there's obviously something wrong and I need to purchase something or do something right. to ha live a better right. life. Well, it, where it, none of us are, none of us are free from that to yeah. some degree. It reminds me in a in an oblique way to what Harry Cruz used to talk about mm -hmm. all the time. That is, we are all freaks. Some <laughs> of, for for a person who is hunchbacked or a dwarf, it is visible. For those of us who have inner torments or anxieties or paranoias, or whatever, mm -hmm. it is less visible. But nobody's perfect. We're all damaged. Right. And we have less than a minute. Okay. So yeah. tell me now, having done two very, very serious books of criticism and, and a very funny novel, what are you going to do next? Well, I am happy to say that the, the really cool and small uh, press that published Ballad of Jasmine Wills ha I, has, uh, I, I'm contracted to... Uh, to come out with a short story collection that is set in kind of the same area um, as right. Ballad, but it's a it's 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 like body horror. It's it's going in a completely different. It's, uh, it's about watershed preservation, uh, 3D we, printers, nanobotic uh, peculiarities, uh, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, monsters. And the Talapuchi. The Talapuchi uh, National River, Forest. Yeah, the the, the Talapuchi River uh, and Lake Gwyn, where Camp Calvary. Uh, is in the novel pl weighs heavily when the fish monsters start to arrive. You know, I, I, I live in fear, <laughs> <laughs> but when it comes, I will read it. Lee, thank you very much. Thank you. This so has much. been fun. It has been.